Good morning. All kinds of crazy sounds behind me there, huh? We got it? I think we got it. If you need a Bible, no, it's still there, John. There, you got, I think you got. Okay. Nope. <laughs> That's what I get for using Valerie's side of the mic. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll get one into your hands. Kind of everyone's got one, fantastic. If you're here for the first time, we're at Calvary Chapel Church. What does that mean? Um, I know that coming out of a religious system my whole life, I walked into my first Calvary Chapel and I just fell in love. I loved the worship and I loved that they taught the word through the Bible. We're in the book of Hebrews, and this is the last chapter of Hebrews. And if you hadn't been there with us, I wish you could have gone through Hebrews with us, because it's just been amazing. But every time I get to a book in the Bible, I, I get excited about it. But Hebrews is special. And to have been in chapter 11, we spent five weeks looking at the heroes of the Bible. And we just took the time to look at each one of them and the circumstances that they were involved in and the difficulties they were involved in and we saw their failures and we saw their victories but what we saw in it more than anything and what the writer of the book of hebrews is sharing is that we saw how god loved their faith it just god loves faith it's the sweet kiss that we can give him on his cheek he he's a creator of heaven and earth all powerful and created us gave us a free will and when this free will demonstrates faith, it puts a smile on God's face. And it's so important because circumstances are difficult. And faith, when things are easy and going perfect, you know, it's not hard to have a lot of faith. But when you go through life difficulties, faith is tough. And God knows our flesh. He's lived in it through Jesus Christ. He understands the difficulties. He understands how hard it is. Um, and he also, as a Christian, has empowered us to do what's right, even when our flesh has a hard time with it. And that really, in our flesh, we can't do it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's in Christians that gives them the ability to do it. Christians have to be obedient. But in that obedience, God empowers our faith to do what's difficult. And you and me live in a world that's getting more difficult by the moment to do what's right. It's going to take a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to do that. And by doing that, and by the faith that we have, it pleases God. And it's important for us to remember that. So as we look at the last chapter, a lot of instruction involved in it. Hebrews 13, verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. As he closes this book out, one of the things that you'll see as these books close out, the writers are writing really important things, things that you really want you to see. You're not going to get to get any more information out in this letter than what's written right here. So he starts it out with, keep on loving each other. If church fellowship is based on anything other than love for Christ and one another, it simply won't last. It's the foundation. It has to be in place. I don't care what else you do. If it doesn't have that, it will fail. Verse 2, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Now look, you and me it may have never entertained an angel for doing something good to a stranger, but it is possible. And the words angel here in the original language can mean angel or messenger. And, you know, we've had missionaries come, and they've come and stayed at our home when they're down. And we really were blessed by these messengers of God. Verse 3, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. It wasn't unusual in that day and that time for Christians to be arrested and put in prison just because of their faith. It happens in the world that we live in today. And they wanted 
the writer wanted us to keep them in mind, to help them in the way that we could, and be there for them. We look at this and we can look in our life. There are people that are Christians that are going through difficult times and hard times, and it gives them, they not necessarily be in prison, but we can be helpful to them. We can come alongside them. We can give them encouragement. Ministering to people in the name of Christ, the Bible tells us, as if you're ministering to him himself. When you do something for another Christian, when you give of yourself, it's Christ feels as if you're doing it to him also. And when we looked at Matthew 25, 35, verse 35, it says, for when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was stranger, you invited me into your home. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger to show you hospitality? Or naked to give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or came to visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. The word of God. In our free country, we're not arrested for religious beliefs, but in other parts of the world, it's common. Believers suffer in their faith, and we need to pray for them as if we felt the, pra- the pain in our own bodies. We need to pray for the people around the world that are serving God, the missionaries, the people that are in difficult situations that we don't even comprehend. We're to keep them in prayer. Verse 4, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Marriage needs to be honored by all. God instituted marriage. We should remember that because God instituted marriage before sin ever entered into the world, it's his holy will for humankind. To treat it unclean as the world does, or even to make jokes or puns as some of us Christians do at times, is undermining God's holy institution. Those who are married should be faithful to their vows and keep their marriage beds undefiled. In spite of this modern world's opinion in this area, the fact remains that sexual relationships outside of the bonds of marriage are sin, and that's what God calls it, not what the world calls it. Adultery is sin. And it's a sin which God will certainly judge. No form of immorality will escape. He judges it in this life, and unless pardoned through repentance and the blood of Christ, God will judge it in an eternal fire. These aren't my words. These are the words of God. Now, Hollywood will tell you just the opposite, but Hollywood doesn't set the standard for the world. God does. The book of Proverbs makes it plain that if you give yourself outside of marriage, you will experience a destruction of your soul due to the fact that when two people come together physically, it's not only the blending of two bodies, it's literally the blending of two souls. I'll read it for you. Proverbs 6.32, but the man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. He will be wounded and disgraced. His shame will never be erased. Not really popular to hear these things in the world that we live in, is it? But the word of God is truth. The word of God, the word of God is the standard. There's nothing in the world of the word of God that would not make us humans better than we are. Verse 5 tells us don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. You know, the, mon- the love of money, it can be a hindrance to the believer. I'm talking about the love of money. No matter what you think, you'll never think you have enough doesn't matter how big the bank accounts is, doesn't matter how much credit line you have, it's never enough. The love of money will steal your thoughts. It'll steal your peace. The love of money when you don't have it keeps you thinking everything would be wonderful if you did. And the love of money when you do have it keeps you thinking how do I protect it? So many people as they get older lose everything. They get 
involved in Ponzi schemes and everything else. But I can't make enough interest in the bank, so I'll try to use my money to do that. And then you find them working at Home Depot for wages because they've squandered everything. Look, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Honestly, I watch so many people fall in that trap. The Ponzi scheme works off of our flesh. It works off of our human nature. Hey, just give me $50,000 and I'll turn it into $100,000. And they do it and you think, okay, man, if 50,000 got me 100, man, this 100,000 could get me 200,000. And they just keep going and they're going and going until they take it all. And it happens from $50 to millions of dollars. Be aware of that kind of stuff. Love of money keeps us from trusting what God says. I love the Lord's Prayer. It's such a simple prayer. And it's not, we've confused that by calling it the Lord's Prayer. It's human's prayer given by Jesus on how to pray. And I love how it starts. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and that, that's so important because when I do a service for someone that's passed, I always read the Lord's Prayer, but I break down every sentence because there's so many people that have done this and did a rosary and did all this stuff over and over and over again and said it over and over again, but never thought about every word that was in that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Do you know how comforting that is? Tomorrow is too big for any one of us. There's more in the morning. If you're a person like me that compulsively thinks, it'll wear you out. It'll wear you out. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, give us what we need today. And then tomorrow we'll pray for that day again. It's not that we're to be foolish and not think about the future or to be wise. But if we're constantly dwelling on what's going to happen next year, what's going to happen to the economy, what's going to happen to our coming election, thank you. Please don't spend all your time watching the news and YouTube. It will steal your joy. It will steal your joy. Man, it does. It's such a trap. And... the rhythms that are set up, that the minute you do something that you want to see, it starts feeding you what you want to see. You know, um, give us this day our daily bread, Lord. Now, church, vote. If the church voted, we could change the world. And look, don't vote for personalities. And as a pastor, we're not allowed to say vote for this person, vote for that person, which I don't think we have the right to do anyhow. Everyone has a right to do what they want. But what I'm telling you is stop looking at the person and start looking at the policy. Who wants to protect Israel? Who wants to protect the unborn? The things that God says are the things you have to look at. I personally can't stand the person that stands for those things. Got any ideas who I'm talking about? I don't like his personality. I don't. Makes me ill. But if this is what he's going to stand for, I'll give you an example of something that somebody helped me with. They said, if you had cancer, and the greatest cancer doctor in the world, the guy that had the greatest success, his plan for cancer was better than anyone else's, but he was a jerk. Would you go pick somebody that wasn't as qualified because you like them? No, you would want the best person for your situation. And I I would wish people would do that instead of voting. Well, I voted for him. When I was 18 years old, (laughs) there was an election in Fremont. And I picked the person I was going to vote for. And a fireman cousin of mine said, who are you you voting for? And I said, so-and-so. And he goes, well, why? because he had studied. And I said, well, because he looks like a big teddy bear. And he said to me, that's why you're voting for him. And I never understood (laughs) till now how ignorant that was. And yet we have people being that ignorant. Well, look, church, I didn't come to church today to talk about politics. The bottom line is, you guys, if the church voted for the people that are protecting those things, those things throughout history, if we would just study history, 
in, in the Bible, when Israel had a king that obeyed God, Israel was blessed. When Israel had a king that didn't obey God, they fell apart. It's important, you guys, and, and I don't know, we need to say no less, no more. The greatest riches a person can have are belonging to God's promises, and I love them. I will never leave you or forsake you, are the words of God. Verse 6, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What, mere, what can mere people do to me? These words are from Psalm 11, Psalm 118.6. The confidence of a person who has Christ. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I got to admit, if I spend time watching the news, fear steps in. It's created that way. No, don't be ignorant, but you can get all the information you need in five minutes. It just keeps coming over and over and over, and you dwell in fear. The fact is that in Christ, we have a perfect security, a perfect protection, and a perfect peace. It doesn't mean everything's going to be rosy and we're not going to have challenges. We live in a fallen world, but we have heaven. We have eternity. We'll spend eternity under perfection of God. That's what we rest in. That's where our peace comes from. Our peace doesn't come from the world and the things of the world. Verse 7, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. We kind of think by reading this and, and the text and the context of this that the word remember maybe suggests that these leaders were gone. They had died, possibly martyred and should not be forgotten. It's easy to forget the courage for some of the leaders of the Christian faith throughout the years. The sacrifices, the labors made it possible for you and me to know the word of God today. But we don't worship people or give them the glory. It's certainly right to honor them for their faithful work. Chapter 11, if, you've not, if you guys have not experienced chapter 11 with us, you can get, Tyler in the back will show you how to get the Calvary app, and it goes into your phone, and all of our sermons are right in your phone. And go listen. It's five weeks, about 35 minutes. Listen to chapter 11. I, it's one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. But the, the heroes of the faith that we read about in chapter 11, and they're to encourage us. Sometimes we look at our circumstance and say, there's no way. There's no way we can deal with this. There's no way we can get through this. And then when you read what they got through and what they did, you're going, well, I guess my way is not that big of a deal. It puts things into perspective. Verse 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That promise is so powerful because it's hard anything that we see in the world that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's constantly changing. The connection of this verse with the next one seems to say that remember faithful believers who held to the faith that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. It's, it's just saying that Christ is always truth. There's never deceit. There's never lying. There's nothing about him like the world that you and me live in. Try and find truth in the world that you and me live in. People just have to say something today. It doesn't have to be true. Most of it isn't. It says, verse 9, so don't be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which don't help the, those who follow them. Speaking about the old covenant, the law, the foods that they were supposed to eat, the religious system, the altars, and the things that were supposed to happen, they were all pictures of Christ coming. Once Christ came, those things disappeared, and Christ became everything. And there's a group of people that want to fall back into that. They understood that religion. They understood what they came from and what they always did. But they didn't. There are so many people that I've met that came out of a church system and they do these things. And I ask them, why do you do these things? And they don't even know. Well, we just do. Our family did that. We do that. They don't understand it. And it says, don't fall back into that. Christ has became everything. 
The Jewish law governed foods. The writer warns them not to go back to that. They're all pictures of Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Verse 10, we have an altar from which the priests in the temple have no right to eat. We present places sometimes when we have churches and we call them the altar. And they're not true altars in a biblical sense. Why? Because Christ's sacrifice has once and for all made the gifts that we bring to God acceptable and we don't need an earthly altar anymore. The altar doesn't become like it did in the Old Testament. No sacrifice could be brought to God in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, unless it went through the altar, the physical altar. Jesus became the path to God, not the altar. And it's so important to understand that. He accepts our sacrifices, and it happens anywhere. It can happen in your home, it can happen in your car, and we'll talk about these sacrifices in a minute. Verse 11, under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of the animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin. Again, a picture of what Christ would finally do. And the bodies of animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So don't let us go out to him outside the camp and, oh, so let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. It was a disgrace to be hung on a cross. But Christ moved beyond the disgrace. He took the penalty of sin that you and me deserved and his blood covered it. The image comes from the Day of Atonement. The sin offering was taken outside this camp and it was burned completely, Leviticus 16. Jesus is our perfect offering suffered and died outside the gate of Jerusalem, Golgotha. He did at the cross. All true Christians must go to him. Why would you go back to the old covenant law when it's been done away with in Christ, is what the writer is saying in this book. If Jesus was to go to a place that was considered a place of disgrace, to bear the sin that humans should have had to bear, then why would you go back to a religious system or religious things that were all pictures of Christ. We have Christ, and it's so important to see that. Verse 14, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home that has not yet come. The challenge is, as we live in this world, and it's hard not to make it everything, but it's not. If we treated it as what it is. This is, a permanent, this is not a permanent place. For those that have trusted Christ, eternity is in heaven. This is training ground. This is making us more like Christ. This is giving us an opportunity to win more to Christ. This is giving us an opportunity to win others to Christ. But it's not forever, and it's hard because we've got to take care of the things in this home. We've got to be able to manage in this home that we live in, but it's a temporary home. This world is not our permanent home. The Bible tells us that. Jerusalem was dear to the heart of those that served in the temple. Religion, many times, is part of our heritage, as I said. The Christians who had no such city on earth, our hearts set for a heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, where Christ will rule and reign in his glory. Verse 15, so, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaim, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Because of this, therefore, whatever you see the Bible where it says the word therefore, because of this, because of what Jesus has done, notice here something very, something that I've never seen or I've passed a million times. Our praise and our prayers pass through Jesus before it reaches God the Father. We do not pray to Mary to reach the Father. We do not pray to saints to reach the Father. We pay, we pray through Jesus, the high priest. And what happens when we pray through Jesus Christ? In the name of Jesus, as we pray, the high priest, Jesus is our high priest. He removes all the impurities and imperfections 
and he, he adds his own virtue to our prayers. I love that, because have you ever been praying, and you're going, Lord, you know, thank you for this and this and that and that, and I'm going, oh, man, i got to get groceries tomorrow, and, and, and oh, man, I didn't wash the car. You know, Val's going to be so mad. You know, um, you know, have you ever done it? And now you're off and in that direction, or your mind's taken off in this direction, and, oh, Lord, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, sorry. You know, and you're praying, and I kind of like that my prayers go up and they're accepted by Christ through Jesus, and then he takes out all the stuff. He edits it. Isn't that cool? Your prayers are basically edited by Christ to God. I'm going, wow, that's a pretty good deal. Um, I loved it when Diane was our secretary here, and she would take all the messages that I taught, and before she put them on the internet, she would take out the and ums and the things, you know, or if I went on some rabbit trace, which I'm capable of doing, and then she would just take that out. So the people that heard me on the, on the air and on things going, man, that guy's pretty good. I'm like, you got to come to church to see how bad he is. <laughs> um, and then, so, you know, it's just so cool when I saw that, that my prayers are purified in Christ as they come to God. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that all believers are priests. Wow. They're holy priests going into the sanctuary of God to worship. We see in these verses three of the sacrifices as priests, as Christians, that we bring to the altar. Jesus is our altar to heaven. The first sacrifice is our life to him. We're a living sacrifice. We die to ourselves. We die to our flesh, and we live for him. A sacrifice is kind of easy. It goes, it's dead, it's gone. But a living sacrifice is a constant dying to yourself. And that means if yourself wants to do something that's not of God, you've got to die to that. You've got to bury that. And you've got to do the things of God. So that's, that's the first thing that we see is the sacrifice of our life to him. Second sacrifice is our praise to him. The worship that we had in church just before we started is a sacrifice to God. It's, it's, a, it's lifted up to him. I used to come to church and I'd come 40 minutes late so I could miss all the music and hear the word. I never understood what the worship was. And one day a third grade Bible teacher that I was helping in a church told them it was as if you, you sat on your father's lap and gave him a kiss on the cheek. That's how sweet worship is to him. And then all of a sudden the music became totally different. The words became totally different. I've got grandbabies. When they jump on my lap and give me a kiss on the cheek, there isn't anything sweeter. I can do that with God by worshiping and to singing to him. Man, it doesn't get any cooler than that. Brought on a whole situation. That's the second sacrifice we see to him. And the other sacrifice we'll see here is our material resources, the things that God has given us that we're to share with others, to help others, to be there for the others, support others. 1 Peter 2, 5 tells us, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. The Bible's saying this. It's not me telling you you're priest. I look at you and I go, nah. Well, a couple of you are Okay. I look at me and I go, wow, how could I be a priest? But the Bible tells us when I trusted Christ, that's what I am. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. And we are royal priests going out into the world to witness, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are not like that. He says, because you are his chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Peter in that 1 Peter 2, 9 is talking about worldly people, and he says, but you're not like that, for you are a chosen people. These are the words of God. Verse 16, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. I, I love it when people go, well, I, I want to please God. I don't know how to please God. Well, if you'd read the Word of God, the Word of God tells you how to please Him. It's so cool. It's so simple. The Word of God people want to make complicated. 
It wasn't written to be complicated. People make it complicated. It's simple, it's basic, it's fundamental. It's said that you can be in there with the third graders and teach them the same thing that I'm teaching you. I know that because I taught third graders. In fact, they listen better. <laughs> See? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Other-centeredness. Thinking of others more than you do yourself pleases God. We're never better. Verse 17, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. When a servant of God is in the will of God teaching the word of God, the people should submit and obey to that. This doesn't mean the pastors should be dictators. I've seen it. Some church members have a flippant attitude, though, towards their pastor's authority, and that's dangerous for them. One day, every pastor will have to give an account for his ministry to the Lord. Some of the stuff I see on TV, I don't know why that doesn't scare them. I don't know why that doesn't scare them. But also a disobedient Christian will have to give an account for their disobedience to God's authority. Now remember, we're talking about a pastor and elder that is in the will of God, teaching the word of God. Verse 18, pray for us, for our conscience is clear and we want to live honorably in everything we do. You see, this is the kind of pastor, leader, you want to submit to. One who strives to live honorably to everything they do. This does not mean that they're going to be perfect but their heart's desire is to please God. Nobody standing behind this pulpit will ever be perfect. I've shared with you, perfect is my favorite word. If there was a color crayon that would be my favorite color crayon, it would be called perfect. I, I love perfect, but perfect as a human being is not achievable. And construction, no matter how many times you measure, no matter what you do, finding perfect isn't there. And if you're striving for it all the time, you can get discouraged. You do the very best that you can to come as close to perfect as you can. And I shared this before. I have a friend who's a machinist, and I said, I should have been a machinist because you guys work with perfect tolerances. You guys get to do perfect. And he goes, no, no. The difference in the air density in a day can change our measurements. The only thing that we've ever seen in the whole world that's perfect is God. You know, and that's why I think I love the the, the word perfect so much. We should strive for perfect, but you do your best, and then you commit the rest of the Lord. As a leader, you're not always going to please people. You have to tell people difficult things. Nobody wants to hear difficult things. But a leader should try. If a leader's not trying, then find a leader that is. Verse 19. And especially pray that I'll be able to come back to you soon. The book of Hebrews has been argued about on who the writer is. We don't get a signed thing that I'm Paul or, you know, Apollos or whatever we don't get. I've always felt that Paul was the writer of Hebrews. And the, one of the reasons that I felt is that verse 19 sounds like Paul. That's what he kind of wrote in all of his letters. Especially pray that I'll be able to come back to you soon. He's visiting the churches. He's establishing the Bible and the Word. It felt like him. I'll, I'll share more about that in a minute. We're getting close. Verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought us up from the dead, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and rectified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. The most important thing we need from God is to be able to do his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. The good things in this world should be pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I love that to make you perfect, we see in the King James, or to equip you with all you need. The translation in the Greek word is familiar to people that received that letter. Doctors knew it because it meant to set a broken bone. 
To a fisherman, it meant to mend a broken net. To a sailor, it meant to outfit a ship for a voyage. To a soldier, it meant to equip for an army, for a battle. Our Savior in heaven wanted to equip us for life here on earth. Tenderly, he wants to set broken bones in our life so that we can walk straight and run in life circumstances. He wanted to repair the breaks in our nets so that we might be fishermen of men and win souls. He wanted to equip us for battle and outfit us so that we, will be bat- we won't be battered in the storms of life. He wanted to mature us so that he could work in us, through us, that which pleases him and accomplishes his will. What a difference it would make in our lives. And if we turn to Hebrews 13, 21, in our personal prayer, every day, Lord, would you equip me for what I need in doing your will? May you produce in me the power of Jesus Christ through every good thing that is pleasing unto you. Do it through Jesus, and may he receive the glory. What a beautiful prayer that would be to start your day. Verse 22. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to pay attention to what I have written in this brief exhortation. I love that he says brief. Pastors don't even know what brief means. He speaks of his epistle, Hebrews, as a brief one. And considering how much more he could have said about the Levitical system and the Old Covenant and how it finds fulfillment in Jesus Christ in the New Covenant, it could have been a lot longer. In verse 23, it says, I want you to know that our other brother, Timothy, has been released from jail, and he comes here soon. I will bring him with me to see you. You know, these guys are being thrown in jail for their faith. And when we see again the mention of our other brother, Timothy, has been set free, it looks like Paul in this letter, because Paul and Timothy have been working together. Verse 24, greet all your leaders and all the believers there. The believers from Italy send you their greetings. May God's grace be with you all. The book of Hebrews, where we see the New Testament come so clearly, how wonderful it is to end on the note of grace. Grace with you all. The New Testament covenant is an unconditional covenant of free grace, teaching God's limitless favor for unworthy sinners through the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. We're not, Christians need to be humble. We're loved by God and seen as his children because of what Jesus did. Nobody will ever stand before the Father ever in righteousness without the blood of Christ covering them. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have that blood covering You'll have to stand before God, a perfect God, who cannot accept anything but perfect. And you'll have to try to justify that you were perfect. And there's not a person in this room and there's not a person on this earth that can do that. Perfect is achieved by what he did. He came, he lived a sinless life, he showed us how it was done, and then someone had to pay the price for your and my failure. And he did that. He did that on the cross. And his blood covers you and me that have trusted him as Lord and Savior. And now rules don't govern my life because I don't like rules. Laws and rules go against my flesh. I fight against them. Even when I try to obey them, I don't do a very good job. Have I ever gone over 65 on the freeway? I don't like rules. If you're trying to get to heaven by obeying rules, you're in trouble. Because Christ loved me so much that he died on that cross and his blood made forgiveness, it was the Father's plan from the very beginning. The word of God in the Old Testament told us that this would happen. And that blood covers me. And as God sees me, He sees me through that blood, and he sees me as that sacrifice that makes me perfect. God thinks I'm perfect. Isn't that amazing? The creator of heaven and earth can look at such a flawed human being 
And so why do I do what's right now? It's out of gratefulness. I'll obey out of love. I'll obey out of gratefulness. As Christians, we should do what's right, not because of rules. We should do what's right because someone did what God did for us. As the worship team comes up, Hebrews teaches us we have a better covenant, a better mediator, a better hope, a better promise, a better homeland, a better priesthood, better than the best of Judaism or any other religion could offer. It assures us that we have eternal redemption, eternal salvation, and an eternal covenant, and best of all, an eternal inheritance. Because of our many privileges as Christians, we have a special responsibility. The superiorities of Christ makes us the most highly privileged people in the world, church. We have to remember that. If such privileges are neglected, we suffer a great loss. More is expected of us those, than those that lived under the law. And more is going to be required in the coming days. Man, what a book, the book of Hebrews. I love it. I'm going to miss it. Don't be a stranger to it. It's a great book in the Bible. They're all great. But um, if you haven't been with us, if you haven't been following along, Tyler in the back there running the words and the stuff, he's a genius. And he'll put the app on your phone for you, and you can hear a sermon anytime you want right from your phone. It doesn't get any simpler. Would you stand with me? Hey, if you're here today and you haven't been in church in a while and you kind of forgot what church was about, kind of forgot what Christ had done for you, God reminded you, man, move forward in your walk. There's a prayer team over there that would love to pray with you. We don't sign you up, send letters, or do anything like that. We just want you to be right with God. I love the Calvary because we're going to be in the next book. We're going to be in James next week, Lord willing. And you can be one chapter ahead. I love that systematically we teach the Bible. So you're not jumping around grabbing a verse here, grabbing a verse there, trying to do something here or there with it. The Bible just proves itself as you read through it. So if you don't leave here without getting someone to pray with you, make sure we have a Bible in your hands and... Don't be a stranger. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender. Father, we pray that you would quiet us down. That we'd spend more one-on-one -on -one time with you in your word. And don't let us get up in the morning. Don't let our feet touch the ground until we've asked you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Enabling to be obedient enable us to have the faith that you desire helping us to please you lord because you so deserve it in jesus name and the church said god bless you guys have a great day.